is the Monday, July 26 meeting of Planning and Development Committee. I'm calling the meeting to order. We have a quorum and uh, I believe that we need, um, uh, I believe we need someone to make a motion with respect to the governor's, um, the governor's orders. Could someone do that? I'll make a motion to suspend the rules to allow us uh, to meet remotely in accordance with Governor Pritzker's emergency declaration. Second. Thank you, Councilmember Newsman, and whoever the second was. All right, uh, Johanna, would you please call the roll? Uh, Councilmember Kelly. Councilmember. Oh. Sorry. Councilmember Wynn. Aye. Councilmember Newsman. Aye. Councilmember Burns. Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Suffredin? I'm sorry. Aye. Aye, okay. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Okay. Ayes have it. All right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, first item we have on our agenda is public comment. Ms. Knighton, would you call, uh, tell us who's first on the public comment? Uh, first is Joe Roth and then Tina Payton. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Roth. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Joe Roth with the Illinois Association of Realtors. Uh, I'd like to express our significant concerns with the conversations on rental license, licensing. Uh, the majority of the city's housing providers are excellent at what they do, providing quality housing. Adding burden to this group to address bad actors just isn't appropriate. There are other better mechanisms to address unpermitted construction, which appears based upon the memo to be the biggest concern we're talking about here. Uh, there's another piece in there um, that would, as it indicates, seems to hold housing providers accountable for the actions of their tenants through nuisance premise ordinance. Uh, it's at best impractical and um, it really kind of lacks the understanding of the requirements currently on housing providers. Here in Evanston, providers must uh, adhere to a number of tenant screening requirements, you know, human rights, fair housing, just housing, a number of uh, different requirements that are placed on them when screening tenant applicants. Uh, in addition, you have the landlord tenant ordinance which prescribes various components of their relationship with tenants and at some points convict, uh, conflicts with the previously mentioned requirements. So the, the fact is, is that these people don't really have control over the behavior of their tenants. Um, so we think that responsibility for tenant behavior should first and foremost rest with tenants themselves. With all that said, we'd love to work together to help craft policies that are going to address the concerns outlined in the memo without unduly burdening the high quality housing providers uh, in the city. Um, you know, what they're doing right now is very critical. Uh, I think we all know there's a shortage of housing inventory and to impact that would be a mistake in our opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Ms. Payton. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, good evening, everyone. So um, I would like to uh, agree with uh, the previous speaker and some of his comments. Uh, we've had um, several years ago, uh, had a committee uh, with former Alderman Wilson, Rainey, city staff and Chief Eddington and another police officer. And we had uh, very long meetings for almost a year about the nuisance ordinance and I thought we came to a happy meeting. I was in attendance to every meeting. And we also had several uh, landlords from Evanston uh, on the committee as well. And to me, it seems like you need to enforce the current laws already on the books. Uh, this seems like uh, you're just uh, stirring the pot again. For what reason, I don't know. Um, we have um, been talking about the three unrelated for about 40 years now. Uh, keep three unrelated in place. You haven't had any conversation with uh, landlords. 
Uh, you're trying to now charge more money for a uh, rental license. And uh, we're, uh, landlords have not had any help here, uh, especially small landlords. And now you're trying to add more fees. We're holding down tenants here in Evanston, especially us with affordable units. And uh, some of us are not getting paid rent. And here you are trying to put down more uh, fees. This is inappropriate and you need to uh, enforce what's already on the books. And I don't think you should be having any conversation about this without having a meeting with the landlords on what you plan on doing with rules and regulations. And I think you're just making up new ways to uh, give a free pass to landlords who are not doing the right thing. Black Lives Matter, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Payton. Uh, Ms. Niden, do we have anyone else on who has signed up for public comment? Uh, we have a number of people who've signed up for an item that's going to be held. Do you want to go through that with them first or continue on the discussion items? Uh, why don't we go ahead and take P1 and we should make sure we let uh, the, those people know. Everyone who has signed up for P1 um, at the request of Alderman, uh, excuse me, Council Member Sufferden, we are going to hold this. And uh, you are welcome to um, provide your comments, but the plan is to hold this item tonight until the next city council meeting, which is August 9th. So why don't I go ahead and read that in, Johanna, and then perhaps we can see if people want to comment tonight or whether they want to, to wait. So item P1 is ordinance 61021, designating Evanston landmark status for the property located at 2715 Heard Avenue. I move to hold this item. Second. All right, I, I heard a second. So I give our, our rules say that uh, when an item is moved, is held and seconded, then it will be not discussed. But of course, uh, we can go forward with public comment. Um, so if, if people are signed up for public comment and they still want to speak on this item, of course, you're welcome to, but we are not going to be discussing or, or in any shape or, or form until um, August 9th. So uh, you're, of course, welcome to come back to our next meeting. And if you do want to speak tonight, uh, we'll, we'd be happy to hear from you. But you might want to save your time. Just point of uh, information, just because I, not a big deal here, but I just in the future don't want to see it happen. The item wasn't before the committee yet. And so you, you, you first have to be before the committee before it's held, just as a procedural thing. So in the future, if something comes up that's less controversial than this that it gets a proper it's properly on the floor and if anyone wanted to speak to it they could first and then someone has to be recognized in order for it to be held all right thank you very much council member reed i recognize uh, for pointing that out um i i think that's probably because i am remote tonight so um thank you for pointing that out and i agree with you all right um miss lyden could you um call the first name of someone who was signed up for P1. How many uh, folks had signed up? Uh, it looks like there were five signups for P1 and then there's one more signed up for the discussion item. So right now we have Bernie Citron, Mary McWilliams, and then Carla Sutton. Bernie and Mary signed up for P1. Okay, uh, Mr. Citron, did you still want to speak to this item? Chairman and members of the council, no, I will defer all my uh, speaking and comment until the, the next council meeting. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And uh, Mary Nick Williams, would you like to speak to this item? No, I'm ready. I'm willing to uh, defer till the ninth. Thank you very much. All right, and then Johanna, the, uh, I don't remember the third Car name. Is Carla, Carla Sutton. Sutton? Mr. Sutton, would you like to speak to, to this item despite the fact that we've held it? No, I want to speak to D2. D2, okay. Uh, all right, please go ahead with D2. Okay, thank you, Alderman Wynn. First, I'm very concerned about the draconian measures that staff has come up to address a problem that has been very, very difficult and a very, very large concern for minority landlords such as myself 
who have income property to try to supplement our, our pensions and, and Social Security. My first recommendation is to just discard and remove all of these from consideration because they are not addressing the problem. It took me an hour and a half this week to get a case number for a nuisance on my property. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The landlords get no respect. The tenants, when given uh, 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 the uh, uh, statement that I wasn't going to renew the lease, uh, disconnected all the smoke detectors and then called in uh, the inspectors without contacting the landlord about making a visit. So I'm not on in favor of any changes that will make more difficult for me to be a landowner and pay more money for this service. I pray that in your discussion that you will send this back to staff and tell them either enforce the laws equitable and without racial discrimination as they've been doing in the past and maybe we could have some ground to go for. Well, with these new recommendations and these new fees for landlords, it's a none binder from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Ms. Niden, is there anyone else who has signed up to speak? Uh, the last three speakers all signed up for P1, Stuart Cohen, Andrew Nebel, and Gary Shoemaker. Okay. Um, Ms. Stuart Cohen, would you like to speak uh, to P1 or would you like to wait until August 9th? I believe I don't see Mr. Cohen on the call anymore. Um, uh, Joanna, who was next? Uh, next was Andrew Nebel. Mr. Nebel, are you still on the call? Luke is saying no. Okay, that's fine. And the last one? Gary Shoemaker. Mr. Shoemaker, I don't see his name either. Neither do we. Okay, all right. Okay, so does that complete public comment? That is the list. Sorry, that okay. is the list we have, and uh, I don't believe anybody signed up in person here. All right, so let's move on to items for discussion. Uh, I will read in the first one, D1, Discussion of Ordinance 54021, amending Title Seven, Chapter 8, Section 8, Tree Preservation. The staff requests direction from the City Council on the proposed recommended action with respect to tree preservation. All right, um, we'll open this for discussion. Uh, do we have a staff brief summary? So this was uh, in response, this, this, the ordinance is not going to return to the council until I believe the second meeting in September. Uh, but this was when it was last before the Planning and Development Committee meeting in May with the previous council, we agreed to provide an update on progress to date. So this is really just an update on our activities. Dave Stonebeck is in the council chambers, and I believe he may have staff on the Zoom call as well if there are questions. Okay, Mr. Mr. Stoneback, did you want to tell us what the progress is that uh, that you can share with us about what what is different about this than how what was brought to us on May in May 10th? Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. Dave Stoneback, Public Works Agency Director. Uh, there is no change to the ordinance at all. The purpose of tonight's meeting was to, just to give you an update and some of the things that staff are contemplating. And I would like to have Emily Akulu, uh, public services uh, coordinator, uh, come on in and give a brief summary of what we propose. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair and members of uh, the committee. My name is Emily Okalau. I am Public Services Coordinator for the Public Works Agency. Um, and the, the item that we have tonight um, is a proposal to work with council members throughout the city um, to participate in outreach to community members um, to solicit their feedback um, regarding developing a, a tree preservation ordinance that would require a permit for the removal of trees on private property. Okay, uh, I will open it up to the committee. Does anyone have comments or questions? 
Yes, uh, Council Member Wynn. This is uh, Council Member Newsma. I'm not sure if anyone right else, in. just so, right since you're not in the room, does anyone else have any questions on this one? It looks like uh, Council Member Ravel may, uh, also has some questions, but. Okay, and Council Member Kelly. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Okay. Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you for the, for the work on this ordinance. And I am noting uh, in the, uh, the proposed outreach uh, process that the um, environment board is listed as uh, as a secondary step. Uh, I think we have a lot of experience on the uh, environment board, uh, folks that are uh, certified as tree keepers and um, a lot of expertise already exists on that board. And I would like to see the environment board kind of elevated in terms of the public outreach and you know made uh, you know, a collaborative partner or, or perhaps the primary outreach uh, uh, mechanism for this um, as this moves forward. So I just want to yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, and then one question uh, in the memo uh, specifies homeowners uh, and I just wanted to clarify that the ordinance would apply to commercial properties as well so uh, would it be more proper uh, to say property owners rather than homeowners just so I understand it yes that is correct okay be property owners and we don't have any issue uh, we will meet with the environment board as our first step in uh, public outreach Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Back to Council Member uh, Wynn, uh, Alderman Ravel has put her light on. Yes, um, all right. Alderman uh, Ravel. Yeah. Um, you so I have just a, a question in terms of sort of what the timeline for this community outreach would be since we're almost into August, which is a little difficult to have a well attended ward meeting. Could, what, do you have a time frame in mind for the outreach? Uh, yes, we we thought we would begin more in September and October. September, October, and November. Realizing December, we won't get much. Maybe have a final uh, citywide uh, meeting in January, and then we would hope to bring uh, an ordinance based on our citizen comment uh, back to the city council in March. Oh, I, I appreciate having an extended period of time. I think it makes the public comment more meaningful that way. And we want to try to bring something back to council in March before the construction season that would occur potentially in the following spring. Dave, uh, this is uh, Melissa. I, I see you, Claire. I'll call on you in just a sec. Would, did, if in, by bringing it to the council in March, does that get us far enough ahead of the construction season so that uh, when people are making plans, they'll know that this is in place? I would think that we would have to uh, make a date by which if, if a permit has not been submitted by a certain date, that that's, then the ordinance applies to them. So uh, if somebody put in a, a permit in January, you know, or December, January to start construction in the spring, then they would be allowed to, they would be, they would not be required to adhere to the new ordinance. Okay. All right. So the sooner we get this through the council and, and early, early next year, the better we are. Yes. And if we can complete our public outreach, we'll bring it back as, as soon as we can. So if we can have a meeting in early January, we'll, we'll try to get it back in February. Just wanted to give us some opportunity to make sure we do it right. No, that, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next, I have council member Kelly. And so I'm really I'm happy to see um, staff working on this and moving forward. I ask that when this come back, if you could try to identify proposed um, explicit criteria for denial or approval. I see here you mentioned diameter, um, but it would be nice if you could, um, I think, have, like I said, more explicit criteria as to what would um, mean de um, denial or approval of um, removing a tree besides diameter. And I agree. Sorry, and I, I don't have the ordinance in front of me. I, I believe though that we have different classes of tree, class A, B, C, with class A being the most prestigious type of trees. And, and so, yes, we could divide that up by the different classes of trees that we have. 
Okay. Ms. Nyden, is, has anyone else raised their hand or turned their light on? I am seeing no, uh, I'm seeing no response from your colleagues that they'd like to sp speak any further on this. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else would you like to speak? Mr. Stoneback, do you feel like you have some feedback from us? Yes, I believe we have a appropriate direction on how to proceed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, this is an issue that many of us are interested in, so we're looking forward to the public discussion. All right, next on our items for discussion are, is uh, D2, consideration and discussion of rental licensing program, property maintenance violations, and updating nuisance premise ordinance. Uh, it says staff is seeking feedback and discussion on the following rental housing related matters. One, development of a rental licensing program for rental housing. Two, increase of fees associated with housing related violations. And three, strengthening the nuisance premise ordinance. And this is in response to community concern, concerns and a referral by council members Kelly Burns and Ravel regarding rental housing in Evanston. All right, Ms. Uh, should we have a staff report? Um, Ms. Nyden, did you want to give us a, a brief staff overview of this first and then we'll uh, start the discussion? Sure. Uh, this was uh, in response to a referral from the aforementioned council members about um, how to manage our housing, our rental housing stock in um, a slightly, uh, with a slightly new approach. Um, this dovetails with some concerns that have been raised through the plan commission in the discussion of the um, occupancy standard, the way in which we determine occupancy, which currently is three unrelated people. So measuring relationships in housing based on the relationships, which are very hard to determine. Um, people can say they're related to each other and, and what does that mean? So um, we, we've been working through a text amendment with the plan commission for several months now. It's gonna come to council in August for, for consideration uh, for looking at measuring uh, space within a unit, a rental unit, to determine how many people can occupy it, because that's something we can we can measure. But during that process, um, other issues have been raised around rental housing, which is the generation of this memo um, on creating a licensing program, strengthening our nuisance premise ordinance that maybe takes uh, some focus a little less on uh, some of the criminal activities that have to be present in order to determine a property a nuisance, but look at other uh, things that are nuisances generated by uh, tenants that are not um, behaving and conducting themselves as uh, in a positive manner in a neighborhood that has, a, has had pretty significant impacts to neighbors surrounding those properties. Uh, and then um, looking at increasing fees around some of these issues as well, because uh, we have learned anecdotally that some of these fees that we assign to the uh, assess on the properties um, really are are perceived by those property owners as a cost of doing business. Um, so the, those are concerns. So th all those things, um, we're looking for feedback. We've been doing research in other communities across the country on how these issues are handled. Um, nothing that we're prepared to talk about tonight, but I think we're really looking for the interest and willingness of the council on these matters. And then we'll take that and and work to do this. I think one, one thing, um, this was discussed and, and considered many, I think about nine, eight or nine years ago, uh, as one of the, the public comment speakers sp mentioned, um, we would certainly want to have a, a robust engagement process where we would meet with landlords and tenants and try to um, make sure that we're, we're solving a problem and not just creating a solution to a problem we're not entirely sure we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kelly, did you, I saw that you turned on your, your camera for a moment. Would you like to speak to this? Sure, just a little bit. So um, I do agree with Mr. Sutton and Ms. Payton. I do think um, I would want to be very careful and to see how creative we can be in thinking outside of the box. As you know, the council member for the first ward, I have witnessed over and over again um, the issues that are related to absentee landlords who live in other towns. And I don't know, but I have seen um, landlords, the landlords in Evanston, for the most part, everything I've seen, um, they're really we haven't seen the same sort of issues. So I'd want to be really careful that we aren't doing anything that's um, that's harmful or that puts yet additional burden on our on our own residents 
who um, rely on this income. So I ask that we really study that carefully and um, and and also I do think we all, so so I so I'm interested in this, but again I, I ask that we look at how we can approach this with a scalpel so that we really address um, the issue at hand. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, there was one more thing. Yeah, so addressing it with the scalpel and then also enforcement. Absolutely. So I do agree that I think we need to look at how we're prioritizing our enforcement efforts. Um, I think there's a sentiment that sometimes there's um, a lack of prioritizing enforcement where it's most needed in areas, um, again, with landlords who don't live here, who live far away, who are violating um, occupancy rates and then, you know, focusing on sometimes residents and landlords who are local who aren't really causing the very serious issues that are eroding our neighborhoods. So, so I'm looking forward to, to collaborating to see how we can really approach this in a way that's really tailored to our needs in Evanston. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ms. Nyden, can you tell me who else we might have? Council member Ravel just turned on her light and then okay. council member Nuzma. Okay. Um, so, Go ahead. Um, I remember during my tenure on the council that there was quite a discussion about um, about this issue. So it's not quite as long ago as nine or ten years. But um, so I don't know if Sarah Flax, if you if you could remind us what the what what happened with that. I mean, what were some of the issues that were raised at that point that we need to be mindful of going as we tackle it again. Good evening, um, council members. Um, Sarah Flax, housing grants manager. I actually wasn't involved in that, which is really kind of, I mean, <laughs> but, um, but there was a great deal of work um, done at the time. This was about 2012. And what I remember is what um, Ms. Payton talked about, which was that um, Alderman Rainey and Wilson were the lead on it. I remember one of the skirmerhorns was involved. I don't remember what other landlords, but it did result in the um, work on the, um, ultimately, on the um, nuisance premises. Um, but I don't really have a whole lot of information more than that. Sorry. Council Member Ravel, I'm wondering if you're thinking of in 2018, there was the discussion about three unrelated. Um, I think there were some meetings about that. It may be. I mean, I just remember a lot of talk about the how what what to do to revise the nuisance premises ordinance that would address uh, concerns, and and I think we went around and around, and I'm not sure that we ended up yeah. doing anything. There was a major change to the nuisance premises ordinance in um, 2016. Um, uh, Grant Farrar had done a great deal of work with um, the. Uh, fair housing advocates and people who are concerned about um, nuisance premises ordinances frequently um, are very blunt instruments and one of the things that they oftentimes have is just total calls to service and um, our nuisance premises ordinance um, excludes uh, anything that's related with uh, to um, uh, domestic violence and um, people with um, mental illness or things like that, that absolutely have to be. And I think that might be what you're thinking of. Ms. Nyman, can you tell me if anyone else has their light on? Oh, uh, Council Member Newsman. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Council Member Wynn. Um, I had a, a, I have several questions. One is uh, about the difference between a license and a registration. Uh, uh, concept right now we're, we 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 require landlords to register. The proposal is we require them to be licensed. What's the difference? Can somebody address so a that? license a, a registration is just we're we're registering. There's a unit here. We're going to inspect it. It gives us the it it then tells us it's there. We know, the presence of this unit that's rented is there. We inspect it. The, it's, it's effectively voluntary, but certainly if you, our code says if you are renting a unit in the city of Evanston, you have to have it registered. Um, and then if somebody does not have, is not following the code, when we do, uh, do that inspection, we'll write a notice of violation or indicate they have to fix it and cure it by a certain period of time. And then we re-inspect. 
And if they haven't cured it, then we move to a ticket, and it, there's a process. But generally, people fix the, the problem that's there. They didn't know that something was the case, and that's why we have it. So a license is something that's different in that you could revoke it if they're not following the rules. And that's, th that is the kind of thing that we would be looking for direction. If, if there is code that would back um, that sort of program, then for landlords that are not uh, renting units with tenants that are behaving properly, they, they, that gives us the ability to revoke a license to rent a unit. It's not that, we're not adding that many more additional hoops. The, we're contemplating a different fee structure, but that's not that significant dollar-wise. By switching from license or from registration to license, really that, what that gives us is the opportunity to revoke a license. Correct. And the additional fee, uh, as you get closer to a budget cycle, um, would be give us the ability to think about increasing our ability to enforce with more staff. That's that's not considered here right now. That's not the discussion we're having. But it's uh, I know there are deep concerns for more enforcement. We have a staff of X number of people, they can only get to so many units in certain days and respond, and there, that is a fact. And um, so more staff means means more the greater ability to enforce and to, to visit units. So as you're proposing this, the cost of operating the you know enhanced enforcement program would be offset by the increase in licensing fees? It could be, but we would have to study that a little bit more to make sure that that's the case. I don't want to say that. But, right. but, but that would be a, we haven't even done the back of the envelope calculation at this it. point. Well, yeah, put that on the list for on your envelope list. Um, and you're also contemplating maybe changing the initial fee or like an, an application fee. But uh, I assume you haven't quite yet gotten to that level of detail. Correct. We have not gotten to that level yet. Okay. Uh, and in uh, respect of the small landlords who are serving. Um, uh, low-income tenants. Yeah, I like the fact that you're you're contemplating some uh, reduction in licensing fees. Uh, can you tell me what you're thinking there for for low-income uh, tenants? I don't know if we've thought that far ahead. I think the um, we know there are we know of the the properties in certain areas, CDBG target areas. Maybe it's just units that are rented in CDBG target areas are are, are at a reduced rate. Um, those are the kinds of things that we could explore when we start to do that back of the envelope calculation. The landlord would have to make a commitment that would somehow be uh, verifiable and enforceable. Right. I mean, Sarah can tell. I mean, we have a number of um, units that might be um, Section 8 voucher holders or um, other uh, TBRA clients. I mean, th there's a number of programs that landlords identify as participating in, and those could be immediately. And then there's other ones that uh, – Sarah, go ahead. Um. Thank you. I would like to make a comment. One of the things that is very frustrating to our landlords who accept voucher holders um, is that they have to get inspected every single time. And I have talked to HUD about this. I've talked to lots of people about it. Like if they have a clean inspection within six months or a year, can't we just go ahead? And the answer has been no, <laughs> because those are written into each program's regulations. So. When Ms. Payden talks about why are we inspected so much, I've explained to her, we don't have the authority to say we're not going to inspect because if we or the housing authority or whoever is putting those tenants in there doesn't do the inspection, then they get in trouble because they're not following the regulations. But I think that this is the type of thing where, you know, if we are doing the inspections and we don't do all of them, sometimes the housing authority or others have their own inspections, it would be very appropriate for us to try to reduce the, you know, cost and things like that. I mean, it's just, these are the types of things that we'd like to be able to help with. Yeah, that seems reasonable. We don't have a great deal of authority over them. And then one final question about the lease addendum. Uh, what uh, what are you envisioning there? Is that something that would be a, a, a template that you would offer to landlords uh, that they could modify or they would be obligated to follow the certain uh, pro forma? No, that wouldn't be for the, the landlords would attach it to the lease, whether it is the city's model lease or their own lease that has to. But the point is, um, similar to making a summary of the landlord tenant ordinance instead of attaching the whole ordinance it makes it easier for people to understand so this would be with tenants they'd all be signing the lease addendum and it would be probably a one-page thing that says these are your behavioral standards so it's really an attempt to kind of make people think a little bit more about what they're committing to and setting the expectation for tenants that there are behavioral 
um, standards that we expect of everybody living here. We want a pleasant and, you know, congenial community to live in. So, and, and that's something that there isn't anything with the nuisance premises. The lease, leases are supposed to have our um, landlord-tenant ordinance attached to them. And quite frankly, this is where Cook County is um, making a summary of their ordinance, I think, is something that we should do because, you know, it's kind of hard to read through those ordinances and really get to the substance of them, and it's really not fair. I mean, it's kind of like when, you know, one of your software things doesn't update and they give you 18 pages of something to read and agree to. It doesn't really inform people. It just gives them something to sign off on. So this would be an attempt to try to just make people more aware it's of. It's more than just information. It's more than just a brochure on radon. Right. It's something that they're signing when they're signing the lease that says, okay, yeah. That they've I'm, read it and received it, but it's not a legal obligation between the landlord and tenant. It's not no, part of the lease. No, no, it, it, it's It's simply stating the expectation of, you know, behavioral, um, just to make it evident that we do want certain standards. Thank you. All right. Uh, next I have um, Council Member Burns. Oh. Yeah, well, this is Council Member. Oh, yeah. sorry. Council Member Reed here. Uh, what the heck did I just do with my, okay. So, First, I'll raise my first concern with this policy, which, you know, I'm not necessarily against a licensing program. I think that's fine, in particular if it's to hold uh, bad landlords accountable, landlords who aren't um, providing safe, healthy places for residents to live. But my concern is that with a licensing program that's not really tailored, uh, I think we're all aware that racism is a thing, and my concern is that, you know, people will be fearful, you know, their biases will sneak in and you'll think twice, and landlords will think even more about renting to people of color and other folks because of those biases that exist uh, in our society. So I'd really, uh, I like the idea of licensing. I would want to make sure that the, the revoking of a license uh, or I'm generally okay to the idea of licensing, but I, I just want to make sure that it's uh, geared toward a landlord not keeping up their end of the bargain rather than um, tenants uh, because of that fear. Also, I, I did hear mention that the you know the the reductions in the licensing fee would uh, be in CDBG areas, which again another concern that to me seems like it. Uh, it enforces segregation. The CDBG areas are already uh, areas that are primarily low income and black, and by extension, again, because of racism, uh, black and brown. Uh, so I would like to see us figure out a better method or another method. I know that's still in the early stages and that's not what you're suggesting, but uh, just to point that out before we do get anything uh, drafted. And then um, the one thing that I don't think it's mentioned anywhere, but what would excite me about this is to collect more data. I'd love to get data about, you know, as they're filing these annual reports or annual licensing fee one, is that correct? And then. Uh, Excuse me. Um, yes, it would. The idea would be that it would be an annual license. And um, I think we, I see where you're going. And I think we want to collect more information as well, particularly on some of the property. Yeah. What, yeah. what I'd really love to know uh, is the vacancy rate. So how long each of the units that you're registering, has that unit been vacant? How long during the year, how many months out of the year was it vacant? Was it vacant? Uh, I'd also like to know how much you're charging for the rent uh, at this property. So we can, again, we can't do rent control, but I'd just love to get metrics on how uh, rent prices are increasing so we can just create, uh, flag certain issues. Um, th th those are, that's my big feedback, just using this to collect more data, ensuring that we're not reinforcing segregation or racism, and um, I'm just interested to see an actual draft of this. So. And then Council Member Council Burns also wanted to speak. Yes, go ahead, Council Member Burns. Would the would this include property standards violations, the re revoking of a license just in concept, or is this just nuisance, uh, nuisance related? 
Um, I don't know if I have an answer to that since we haven't really gone through to consider with the law department the legal ramifications of different things. I think if, and some of the property maintenance issues might be life safety, they might be, we have a full range of things that could be, could be issues um, for properties that could lead to a, a nuisance premise or if somebody's, it, the, the focus here is really creating safe units for, for people to have inhabit and, but also to address um, the concerns that, that we've had the other conversations about in terms of um, the, the behavior in neighborhoods that creates a, a challenge for everybody else to live in the neighborhood too. So I think it's, it's twofold, but really um, one of our concerns as community develop, as your community development staff is making sure that the units are safe for people to live in um, first and foremost. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it, it should, absolutely we need to make the program equitable, so let me just that cast that over everything. Well, before I say anything, let's just apply that. Of course, we need to sit down with, with uh, you know, small and mid-sized landlords to figure this out and work through it. But um, I do think revoking a license, obviously, is something that is much more enforceable than what we currently have. My issue is not... Uh, the Mr. Suddens and Ms. Tina Paytons, it's a lot of, it's landlords who own much more property than they do in the ward and they're repeat offenders over and over and over again. Um, I'm filing, I'm myself filing property standards complaint after property standards complaint and I'm just one person. And so I think for those, specifically for, for um, those bad actors, we need something that is enforceable and, um, and allows us to take really, uh, decisive action and provide relief for the tenants who are, I can't tell you, at least once a week I get somebody in my ward who is who is considering uh, renting in another location only because there are property standards complaints that, that aren't being addressed in a timely manner. I get that once a week. And so um, I take this very serious. I also take the concerns of Ms. Payton and Mr. Sutton serious, which is why they need to certainly continue to be a part of the conversation. I have a one-on-one a -on -one meeting or a, a group meeting with them coming up soon, which I'm looking forward to, but um, I just wanted to make it clear. I'd like us, as we continue to explore this, to definitely include property standards in that um, exploration. Um, and then revoking the license would likely still go through the administrative hearing process. I know we're still early, but I'm just trying to f fill it out a little bit. Uh, our corp our legal uh, counsel is giving a nod okay. for those at home. Um, and then it's it seems like with the fee, uh, if the, the nuisance premises fee, that this this new amendment or change would be a fee to the tenant and not the owner. Am I reading that correctly? The three hundred. I think that that is a tool for the landlord because there's there's lots of I mean there's lots of issues here. There's we have landlords that are absentee that don't live here that own several properties and they rent to individuals who don't follow the rules. And so there's rules being they're not good neighbors. They don't make they there's a lot of people in the property whether they're invited or they live there. So there's there's challenges. Um, related to landlords managing their tenants. So there's that piece of the relationship. And then there's also the relationship that a property owner landlord has with the city in terms of renting a unit here. And we can address issues with the landlord, um, but sometimes landlords will say, oh, I can't do anything about the tenant doing X or Y. And so I think these are some suggestions uh, to try to address all the pieces of this puzzle because I think the one thing that many of us who've been here for a while have learned that you can't just change one thing and expect all the other pieces. We can address the three unrelated slash uh, issues of occupancy, but we're still going to have many of these other issues because that that alone won't solve it. And we're, so we're trying to think as holistically as possible about this. So um, I think any if there's other things, and I hope this list does, doesn't feel limiting because if there's other ideas that anybody here has, or um, I think. Several of your colleagues have suggested, oh, in this community here, I read about this idea. We're, we're prepared to help figure out if those are things that might work in Evanston and bring those forward to the council so you can consider them. So um, by, any, by all means, suggest other things if, if you think. But I think we're, there's a lot of relationships in this housing and situation to try to sort out, and that's what we're trying to do here. 
And I just want to be clear that that it, I guess this was an example that staff pulled out of Boston and some other ordinances, but it talks about a $300 fine per citation. Um, and I just want to make clear in this, with with this particular option, I know we, we, we don't do that here, but in this option, that would be on the tenant. Um, I'm just trying to get that clear. And the reason why I'm saying that is because to, to Ms. Sutton and, and uh, Mr. Sutton and Ms. Uh, Payton's point, this wouldn't be a new fee on the owner and what this option would be on the tenant, right? I think we were thinking that there's some things that could be on the tenant and there's things okay. that could be on the landlord. I think that's it, it, just like if somebody is um, caught underage drinking, that's not necessary, that there is something that happens to the, per the person who's breaking the law there. there are th if you are breaking the law and you are renting, doesn't just mean that you can avoid being um, ticketed or or uh, culpable for that if you you are still an individual and you have to follow the law um and so i i, I mentioned that because i think that is a um, good thing that we're not adding another fee on landlords but on tenants and so the only and obviously this is early on but the only um increase in fee currently it's it's somewhere in here it's like twenty dollars that we're currently charging um, and that will go, I'm sorry, what's the, it, it's, what are we charging now? It's like $20 a unit is what would, was one of the proposed options. What are we right. charging That's what now? we charge right now. And then if it's a new unit, there's a $200 registration fee. So okay. first kind of first time get you in the system. Okay. So just real, so I'm clear, what are we doing charging now? And then when the increase would be, I don't think we've necessarily, I think there's a, a thought here of just um, a thought, yeah. you know, going up to $30 or, or something more, I think we'd really want to do some consideration of what that fee structure would yeah. look like. This is this is barely back of the envelope. Is like I, yeah. I think to Council Member Reed's point about data, we ha we have information about how, what kind of housing types, what, how many rental properties we have, what types they are. Do you do, we can get you better numbers based on some of that information? And I'm saying and basically what's currently proposed. I think it's a reasonable increase. It's not. It doesn't strike me as something that's unreasonable. And if we can. If it can pay for an additional staff person, I think that's huge. I've had some conversations with staff about this, and there seems to be a sense that that we need additional staff in our property standards department. So I love that part of it, as long as it's again equitable, and if people can't pay it, you know, for hardship reasons, we can help them out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Kelly. Did you want to speak? Thank you. That would be great. I'm sorry. I don't see a raising hand icon on my on the screen. Thank you. Yes. So, um, Ms. Knight, so we currently, you can't revoke registration. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so I think, you know, we have a really special situation in Evanston, given that we're a university town, um, mixed income. And, and Ms. Knight, you know, direct me, I'm still new to all this, but I really think we need a committee. Um, that examines everything from, uh, you know, licensing to three person to the definition of family that includes local landlords, um, residents, staff, council members. I really think we need to look at all of this holistically, not each item separately. So if you could recommend to me how this is where I'd like to see us move right now, rather than, um, you know, sort of patchwork approach to this, actually sit down as a committee and, and craft the plans and the appropriate approaches to address our very special Evanston needs. Could, would I do that here or in council? I mean, if I, I, should I make that referral here? I'm not sure how, but I really think we need to, I really think we need at this point to establish a committee to resolve um, to resolve the serious issues we do have with absentee landlords and, you know, over occupancy of students and nuisance and, and as well as protecting our local landlords. So um, if you could just advise me as to how to proceed, I do think um, it's time that we form a committee to, to develop a holistic approach. Are you directing that to your colleagues or to staff? Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so um, I believe in the past when items like this that have needed a little bit more discussion, um, some subcommittees have been created, and that um, I think there's been sort of a mix of that. It's been some members of, of a committee, or it goes to council, and there's a discussion about how formal that committee would look. So um, yeah, I think it's up to this group. We could come back 
with what the three unrelated is and you could we could make a decision at the next meeting to do that with with that item now joining the planning and development committee if you'd like to to wait and we could maybe flesh some more of the ideas and do some research that has just been suggested here we could bring another discussion item um, with a little bit more information and then and then you could make that decision or um, you could yeah I think we really need to move forward on it now I think um, is it possible thank you very much for that so could we could I refer a subcommittee of planning at PMD so that we can you know I have many active um, residents in, in my ward um, who've been very involved and done a lot of research as well as, like I said, local landlords um, who've also been very engaged, and I think we need their participation. Can I make that referral now for a subcommittee of PMD? Uh, this is Would Alex Ruggie with the Assistant City Attorney. So I think you can make the referral and we can bring it back on PMD on the 9th. Okay. To be voted on. Okay. So I'm making that, I'm, and I'll, I'll write that. I know we're now writing these referrals, but I do think this is um, very much needed a committee to, um, and I'll, I'll write that and, and forward that to Melissa, to uh, Chairperson Wynn and the referral committee. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Councilmember Kelly. I, I think your um, a subcommittee studying all of you know, this collection of rental housing issues that we have, they do interlock with each other. So I think it would be helpful to have that I recognize that what the staff has brought us tonight is one step in that process uh, that we really do need to address. Over the years, we have talked about rental licensing, um, and and I, I think it's fair to say there were concerns, a lot of concerns, partly on how do we make sure that people sign up. So how do how do we enforce that portion of it? Um, and, and so, and then the prior councils had uh, somewhat mixed views about it, but I think that given what we are learning more and more about, and I think some of the things that you experience around the university and certainly the issues that council member Burns uh, raises makes this more and more urgent um, to, to figure out uh, some type of permanent lasting uh, process that make, that we know that we are, have landlords who are providing safe housing and that those landlords are the ones that are are elevated and the ones who are the repeat offenders and i have had those in my ward as well that uh, we come up with a penalty that really works for them uh, council member reed i see that you had your light on yes uh i was originally going to say something else but i do think we have a committee if i'm not mistaken as to the purview of this committee the housing and community development committee which is a newly created committee. I think this might be an appropriate, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm seeing ahead they, they deal more with funding and, and I will, programs. I think this- I will completely yeah. reject that. Uh, my, what I was really gonna say is uh, relating to the licenses being revoked, uh, just as a note, uh, I think for, as we're drafting this, um, one, I, I wanna, as we draft it, I think that the license should, for example, uh, if I own a property and I get my license revoked, I shouldn't be able to just create an LLC and then reapply for a license. So I think it should be written that if you if you get your license revoked, anyone who is either the owner or related to that LLC, whoever the owners are, uh, would also be anyone if they were a, more than a certain percentage stake in another LLC they would also not be eligible for the license just to make sure that folks don't have an easy workaround by creating an LLC or just dissolving one and creating a new one. Uh, and then also, how would this apply to property management companies? So if, you know, I'm a landlord, I got several buildings throughout Evanston and I, you know, I may li live in Sweden or Norway or something, but I have a property management company here uh, who's managing my property for me. Um, would this apply to the property management company? I think we need to think about that. As so the the rental licensing would apply to the unit. So it's like the unit, like a vehicle has a license plate, the unit would have a license attached to it. So to your point of people creating different, you know, oh, my, I don't have anything to do with it, it's now my partners or whatever, like it would be the unit. So 1234 Main Street, unit 2C has a license. You can't, you can't change that whether the ownership changes or not, 
the the license issue is is to that unit, not to the property owner. So if I were to buy a new building and that unit had its license revoked because there's a previous span. Well, that's that- that's something we would have to certainly put in the. Co- I mean, the hope is that a new, lo- just like a business that doesn't have a license, they can apply for a new. You know, a new business can operate in that space. So if if uh, four, five, six, seven Main Street is a commercial space and a new business comes in, one is one business, and the next is a different business. We would still consider that a new business. So um, if a new la- if a new landlord came in. I, mean, I will, I will tell you. Our property maintenance staff knows the units. They know the landlords. They know they're like. If you call and ask them, and you probably some of you have probably already had this experience, you call and ask them. They can tell you, oh, I was in there for this and this. They they have a very good memory. We keep we keep records on all the things in the picture. We have pictures of of units. So somebody trying to get one passed is gets harder when we have a record of what's in the unit. So we could go in if a new owner came upon came took ownership over it. There's property convey there's real estate transfer stamps. There's there's a whole process. You can't just say, oh, I'm the new owner. There's a record of somebody becoming the new owner. And in order to then rent the property, you'd have to have a license. You'd have to be inspected. We have to start the process over. And so in some ways, if a bad landlord who didn't have a license sells the property and a new new person comes in, we get to start over again with that person. And for them to license, we would get that that first crack of that inspection again. But we have all the record from the bad landlord from the previous situation. And then to, okay, and so it's a specific license. So then we're also saying that, you know, bad landlord that has a 32 unit building is only going to get their license revoked for the one unit where there's maybe a bad tenant or? So those are the kinds of things that we, I think a subcommittee could, that's a good subcommittee discussion. You, we have landlords that might just be renting a two or three unit building versus somebody who has a larger building. Um, so a, if a concern is in one unit, it might be in another unit is what I'm hearing you say. And that, that different, creating some rules um, around multi-tenanted buildings could be a good role for the subcommittee. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I say that because to me, I personally would like to focus on uh, I mean, yes, they're bad tenants, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, they can be held criminally liable if they're out, out there breaking the law or, you know, whatever with our reimagining police committee, however we choose to solve, uh, you know, certain issues that are not violent in nature. But certainly I really want to target bad landlords. So that's really what comes to, in my ward, I'm not thinking mm-hmm. about, and we should also state that the problem that we're trying to solve here is, if I'm not mistaken, it's students. We're, we're really talking about students who have created a, a nuisance in a particular area. Am I, am I wrong on Absentee that? Absentee landlords is really where this comes comes in big. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I just want to make sure that we're, we're focusing on the landlords. And if a landlord gets their license revoked for Unit 3B of their 32-unit building, I would think that they'd get their license revoked for all of their units really anywhere in the city if they're the not necessarily because if they're not if the rules are being followed if they are maintaining the unit proper the other 31 units then that has impact at 31 other households which means that they might not be able to rent so i think i'm I'm hearing things that i'm making notes and i think these are all good subcommittee discussions and we can certainly see how other communities deal with it but i'll tell you there are landlords that do really good with some properties and they don't do so good with other properties and it's the same person and there's a mix of various reasons why that might be the case, maybe tenants, maybe other other factors, but we wouldn't want to penalize the individuals in our community who are following the rules, the landlords are maintaining those units, whatever's happening because of one unit. And so the focus is on the unit. It's like, think of it as, as individual units. The landlord is still responsible for all 32 individual units, but it's the, it's the unit. We don't want to take, we don't want to, punish the other 31 who are following the rules. I, Joanna, I, this is uh, Melissa. I, I think that uh, Councilmember Reed raises a really a good point, and also your answer raises another point that, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've always thought my experience is uh, a bad landlord is a bad landlord, no, how many, no matter how many buildings they own, but uh, that's interesting that some that others they maintain better than, than the, the ones that I might get reports about. You 
the subcommittee, which I think should look at this issue really carefully, because you don't want to penalize and end up, um, uh, as you said, affecting people who are living safely in a unit uh, that, that needs inspection. But you might want to, for the subcommittee, to look at some type of um, cumulative effect or a super penalty of some sort, so that if there is the if there is a landlord who, as Councilmember Burns referred to, is is a repeat offender, um, at what point do we stop playing whack-a-mole with that landlord and decide you you aren't eligible to be a uh, to rent here in Evanston. And, and you know, that's something that we could decide, do you have a penalty like that? Or do you just keep um, revoking until they recognize that we're never going to let them get away with having a substandard unit? All right, your colleagues, uh, no more lights are on. So I don't know if Okay, so um, do you have uh, a good direction from us on what to, where to go? I think that this is this has been a good discussion. We have good direction, and I think we'll um, move forward, work with the um, with law on the uh, referral for the subcommittee. The point okay. of just information. Uh, how, I don't know if this is maybe a better question for later during council when Councilor Cummings is here, but. Just to the point that uh, Alderman Kel or Councilmember Kelly is making a referral from this committee, uh, are referrals from committees? So if, if, for example, we have on the council agenda, the herd thing, um, the landmark status, uh, P1, I, I don't know if that's on the council agenda, um, but uh, for, I know it was held today, but for example, are referrals that are made from committees, do those referrals also go through this new referrals committee? Is that something anybody here can answer? Should I hold that for council? How would you hold? We'll get a new, you an answer before city council. And my, the only reason I'm asking that now is because if other referrals from other committee committees aren't going through this referral committee process, I would think that if a referral is made in a committee, it also wouldn't go through that referral committee process. So just looking for clarification. All right, okay, so uh, seeing uh, John already tells me there are no more lights, and that concludes our discussion items at this point. So we have completed our agenda, and so I, so I say for the good of the order, we will adjourn this meeting, and the council will start at, uh, in 10 minutes. So that would be, I'm actually looking at 655 time zones. I, I, thank you very much. I'm looking at two different time zones right now, trying to figure out which one I'm in. Okay. Uh, the council will um, come to order at 655. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, staff.